Good morning and uh, welcome to everyone who's joined us. I'm really happy to have you with us today. Um, my name is Lucy Randolph. I'm the Senior Export Manager for Dairy at AHDB. Um, and we are excited to bring you this webinar. Um, we want to talk you through the report that um, AHDB commissioned. Um, and the full report will be sent out to you post event, but this is to go through the details and give you the chance to answer any questions, ask any questions um, about it at the end of the presentation. Um, I just want to give you a bit of an update of what I'm doing here at HTB. I know most of you are aware of what we do, but for those that aren't, um, I'm responsible for supporting the British dairy farmers um, by enhancing the profitability and sustainability of the British dairy sector. Um, in export markets around the world. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And uh, we're looking to do this through market information and market promotion through things like um, international trade shows, promotional events, um, buyer networking, and uh, conferences, etc. Um, the space is looking a little different at the moment. Um, unable to be in market, we're having to find sort of inventive ways to keep our British dairy profile. Um, as well as trying to keep exporters in touch with market developments and buyers. Uh, we've previously done a few webinars, meet the buyers, a couple of locally resourced trade shows in China, um, tasting promotions in Hong Kong and Singapore, some new marketing content is coming, and most excitingly, we've appointed our first overseas dairy export representative in North America. So working hard to ensure that we're going into 2022 with lots um, of exciting plans. Um, so, right, moving on to the main event, um, this webinar is to understand more about British dairy opportunities in Australia and New Zealand export markets, um, to talk you through the report regulatory, regulatory framework, as well as an opportunity to ask all of our speakers any questions you may have at the end of all the presentations. There is a question box on, well, right or left, wherever you have it. Um, and you can type in your questions and we'll get to as many of them as we can at the end. Uh, this is pretty timely due to the sort of UK New Zealand trade agreement and we can discuss the possibilities of the UK Oz trade deal, but plus why this market has great opportunities for British products and how we can make the most of it. I'd like to introduce our speakers. Uh, Nicola Thomas, who is Director at the Food and Drink Exporters Association. We've got Jane Hunt, who's Director Director of Hunt Export Advice, and who is joining us from Melbourne this morning, or all this evening actually for her, um, and Cheryl Brett, who is the International Sales Manager from Coombe Castle. So just a bit of housekeeping, you'll all stay muted through the opening and closing sessions, although questions can be submitted in the Q&A box um, as we go. Um, ensure the laptops are plugged in to main power. The sessions will be recorded and available on the AHCB website if you want to revisit any of the content. Um, there is a feedback survey and we would ask you do take the time to complete this um, so that we can improve similar events in the future and continue the conversations generated from today's session. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Nicola Thomas. Over to you, Nicola. Great. Right. Thanks, Lucy. No problem. If you can see my screen there. Um, yeah, good morning everyone and many thanks Lucy for the introduction. Um, as Lucy said, I'm a director of the UK Food and Drink Exporters Association, uh, which is a thriving community of manufacturers, wholesalers and retailers who've got international ambitions. Um, and we support them with advice, training and insights to help them accelerate their sales overseas. One of the ways that we do that is through our growing network of in-market sales and marketing partners around the world, including Jane, um, who's a UK export herself. And she's, as Lucy said, not just joining us from Melbourne, where it's nearly bedtime, but it's also a bank holiday. So very many thanks, Jane, for giving up your time to, to be here. So Australia and New Zealand are markets which are increasingly coming into focus for UK exporters. And we've noticed much more interest recently in the region, both amongst our members and the wider food and drink community. Um, I think Brexit has prompted more companies to look outside of the EU than before, um, unsurprisingly. Um, I think new exporters have been put off the EU from the start, and so they're casting their nets uh, much further afield um, to begin with. And existing exporters are also being more proactive um, about spreading their risk across more regions around the world. 
So on the surface of it, Australia and New Zealand are two markets which look attractive for UK companies. Um, they're in the Commonwealth. We speak roughly the same language. Um, there's a strong affinity with um, Britain and Brits and um, those free trade agreements um, are on their way. So the aim of today's session is to assess how attractive they really are for you as UK dairy exporters. So Jane and I uh, will take you through the key findings of the Insight reports. Um, and then you'll have the chance to hear from one of your industry peers, um, Cheryl Brett of Coombe Castle, who's very kindly agreed to share her experiences of selling in the region and how the company has been managing their business in that part of the world through the pandemic. Um, so there's nearly 200 markets in the world um, and as an exporter sitting here in the UK um, we thought we'd take a look at whether there are any factors which make Australia and New Zealand more or less attractive than the other 190 odd countries that you can choose to target. So how do they fare compared to other territories? First of all, um, they're not only on the other side of the world, um, but even if we've got just limited knowledge of them or we've only visited um, as tourists, we probably think of them as quite geographically challenging. Um, just the sheer size of Australia, which is um, just a little bit smaller than the 48 contiguous states of the US by way of comparison, um, and New Zealand, which is the sixth largest island nation, um, stretches almost a thousand miles from the top of North Island to the bottom of South Island. They're also among the least populated, uh, densely populated countries in the world. So um, if you take the UK, we cram about 280 of us into a square kilometer. That drops right down to 19 in New Zealand and a mere three in, in Australia. However, um, the urban populations of both countries are actually higher than those of the UK at just over 86% versus 84% here. Um, the Australian population is primarily located on the periphery with the highest concentration of people living in the east and the southeast. And the state of New South Wales has by far got the largest population at about 32% of the total. And uh, it includes Sydney with around 5 million inhabitants. The city of Melbourne's got roughly the same 5 million um, population and Brisbane drops down to 2.4 million. And in New Zealand, nearly 80% of the 4.9 million population is located in the North Island, uh, mainly centred around the Auckland region, which is uh, the centre for, for business for the whole country. So these population concentrations mean that it's relatively easy to access the majority um, of consumers um, and the number of sizable major cities um, also tend to be a magnet for millennials and for Gen Z who follow trends more closely and they're more open to imported products. So when it comes to the Australian and New Zealand economies, um, I always like to compare export economies to the UK so that you can get a sense of the relative uh, attractiveness. Um, and here I've used a tool which you might be familiar with, but it's the Coface Country Risk Assessment Tool. Um, Coface, a long-standing credit insurance company, um, they, they're in 100 company, countries themselves. And this tool enables you to compare indicators across markets in a really simple way. So GDP per capita, um, Australia's got the sixth highest GDP um, in the world and is up there with markets like um, Switzerland, the US and Singapore. Um, by way of comparison, the UK is uh, 22nd and New Zealand 24th, so we're roughly about the same. And the co-face country risk assessments, um, they look at 160 countries around the world and compare macroeconomic, um, financial and political data. Um, they then qualify or rank countries um, in, in, um, in a range of seven different levels, um, unhelpfully going from A1 to A4 and then B, C, D and E. Um, E's are obviously the most risky, so you probably want to give them a wide berth, but um, uh, as A2s, Australia and New Zealand are pretty safe bets and just nudge ahead there of the, of the UK. Um, some of the macroeconomic factors that make them attractive um, and give them these scores are the fact that they have geographic proximity to the dynamic um, Asian economies. They've got attractive quality of life um, with immigration contributing to population growth. 
They've got high levels of tourism um, with room for even further growth and larger competitive agricultural sectors. Um, and all three countries, um, Australia, New Zealand and the UK, are top performers when it comes to business climate. And in fact, New Zealand came out top of um, 190 countries in the 2020 um, World Bank Ease of Doing Business Barometer, with the UK coming in at eighth and Australia 14th. So when it comes to the trading environment, um, both are open markets and they've got minimal restrictions on imports. Um, the process of opening up in recent years has increased productivity, it's stimulated growth and it's made the economies much more flexible and dynamic. Both countries are significant exporters of agricultural products, including dairy, which we'll be hearing more about um, shortly. And that geographic proximity to those emerging and dynamic Asian markets means that they've got very strong trading links there as well. China, Singapore and the wider ASEAN um, markets are key import and export partners for food and, food and drink products. Um, whereas the UK is Australia's sixth largest food import partner and, um, and New Zealand just squeezes into the top 10. Um, when it comes to free trade agreements, um, Australia's currently got 15 in place and New Zealand's got 12, that's of, of last month as it all seems to be quite change, changing quite quickly. Um, and uh, these these don't trip off the tongue, but two particular ones of importance in building those Asian relationships are the RCEP, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership between the Association of Southeast ASEAN Nations and six other partners, and the CT, the TPPP, I knew I was going to trip on that one, um, the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is made up of 11 nations um, in total, of which six of the others, um, of the other nine, um, apart from New Zealand and uh, Australia, are in Asia. So whilst we don't obviously don't know, know the full impact of the FDA, FTAs um, with the UK, they do indicate um, that the, this is a step towards us potentially becoming members of the RCEP and the CPTPP in the future and opening up those wider opportunities for food and drink uh, exporters in the Asia Pacific region. And finally, what about Australian and New Zealand consumers. Um, obviously, those two countries are now just pulling out of the latest series of lockdowns um, and the trends there are very much in line with those that we've seen around the globe coming out of the pandemic. So in terms of shopping habits, um, consumers are increasingly online and they've moved their, their spend accordingly. Um, in 2019, less than 10% of grocery spend um, in New Zealand was online and that's jumped to uh, over 30% during during lockdowns in 2020, 2020 and 2021. Um, and similarly, Australians have shown um, increasing trust in delivery services and online grocery sales there are expected to leave by almost 50% um, by the end of 2021. And online shopping is expected to pay, play a much more important role in the industry over the next five years. And all the major retailers have already started improving their online offering. There's a preference for uh, one-stop shopping in-store um, due to lockdowns, as in other, other markets, um, but I'm sure we'll see that evolve and a return to a, a wider range of um, shopping outlets like speciality retailers and, and smaller stores. And working, shopping and entertaining from home um, has obviously continued throughout the lockdowns, um, but as in other markets, um, people will become, when they get their freedom, they'll become less nervous about uh, leaving home. So we expect that to, to open up as well. When it comes to health and well-being, um, this is the number one concern for uh, food, when it comes to food pr purchases. Um, there's a very big focus on natural ingredients, immunity boosting products and gut health. Um, and it's also fueling the growth of free from and organic. Um, the Organic Food Board in New Zealand recently published um, some stats that showed that 81% of um, New Zealanders who, were, um, who took part in the survey are purchasing organic products at least fortnightly, and at least 30% of those purchases are in the dairy category. 
uh, to good news. And um, the top two reasons that they gave for doing so are that the fact that they are more natural products and also to protect their family's health. And thirdly, saving the planet is driving purchasing decisions. Um, consumers are not just interested in sustainable products and packaging, but also in production processes. Um, and like other markets, um, governments and trade bodies have made a big push on uh, around buying local. And the, um, for example, the Australian Made campaign, which has been around for lots of years, has literally in the last couple of weeks just um, launched a Buy Australian Now campaign, um, emphasising the fact that every dollar that's spent on locally made and grown products has a direct impact on the livelihoods of Australian growers and manufacturers, as well as the wider community. So in terms of consumer spending, um, household spend on food in Australia is um, at 10%, so that's just, just above the UK, um, whereas at 17%, New Zealand is, is at the higher end um, for food spend, for richer nations who tend to spend proportionately less on food uh, than poorer countries. And the good news is that by 2025, um, in both markets, three categories are forecast to account for 50% or more of total food spend. And those three categories include dairy. So in Australia, it will be the second most important category um, at just over 15%. And in New Zealand, it comes in third at um, nearly 14%. So so far so good if you are a UK exporter. Um, both countries are looking pretty favourable as potential target markets on the surface in terms of economy, demography, trading environment and consumer behaviour. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Jane and she's going to take a deeper dive into the opportunities in the dairy sector. Over to you Jane. Thank you Nicola. So as we've already heard, Australia and New Zealand are both significant dairy traders and the dairy industry is one of Australia's major rural industries and it ranks fourth behind red meat, wheat and wool and 46,000 people are directly employed by dairy farmers and dairy companies. Australia accounted for 4.2% of the Asia Pacific dairy market in 2019, with China making up almost 50%. The one third of milk production is exported, making it the world's fourth largest exporter. And the top five export markets are Greater China, which includes Hong Kong and Macau, Japan, Indonesia, Malaysia and Singapore. And Australia also has a Dairy Export Assurance Programme, which was launched by the Australian government in March 2020, with a five-year plan aimed at building understanding and capability in the dairy sector, as well as refresh and modernise the regulation of dairy exports. And this was the first major investment into the dairy export system for over a decade. Next slide, please. Thank you. So moving on to, to New Zealand. New Zealand is the largest dairy exporter in the world and it exports 95% of its milk production. It's estimated to supply 3% of global dairy products. It's led by dairy cooperative Fonterra, who is the world's sixth largest dairy producer. And the top five export markets here are China, Australia, the US, the UAE and Japan. Export volumes and pricing for major commodities, especially whole milk powder, have fared well during the pandemic. Also, it's been fortunate that much of the food service and consumer products are destined for Asia, where food service has recovered relatively quickly compared to the domestic market. And recent research by Ag Research shows that New Zealand dairy farmers have the world's lowest carbon footprint, which was 48% less than the average of the countries studied. And the industry is, is looking um, at solutions to improve on this even further. Next slide, please. As opposed to developed markets where dairy consumption is falling, 
Australian and New Zealand households are consuming more butter and more cheese. New Zealand has one of the highest per capita consumption rates of fresh white milk in the world, although cheese consumption does lag behind both Australia and the UK. Spending on cheese and butter has outpaced growth, indicating that consumers are purchasing more premium products such as speciality cheeses. The focus of innovation is set to lean towards health, not only in dairy alternatives, but within other products such as fortified, prebiotic and reduced sugar products. And as we've already heard, environmental concerns are increasingly influencing consumers' purchasing decisions and manufacturers are likely to continue to strive to improve the sustainability of their packaging. Next slide, please. Despite having a, a cheese surplus, Australia is still a significant importer of cheese. And recent trends have moved away from soft cheese to cheddar varieties and semi-hard cheese such as feta and mozzarella, as well as milks like sheep and goat, particularly in New Zealand. The pandemic has increased demand for premium indulgence treats for people to enjoy at home and outdoor entertaining and picnics. There's also the current trend for cheese platters when it comes to eating out. On the other hand, there's also been a shift towards value packs and private label by those potentially impacted by the economic climate and a downturn. There is a strong um, support for local producers. However, cheese is the biggest import category and there is strong demand in both markets for British products. Next slide, please. Moving on to, to dairy imports. Over recent years, Australia's imports of dairy products for local consumption have increased. The reasons being to fill production gaps due to insufficient quantity to meet local demand, products permitted as a result of free trade agreements, and also products that are needed as ingredients. And this has enabled the industry to continue to export a significant share of its milk production. Milk imports in Australia have remained steady at 2% of the total volume of dairy imports for the past five years, with the majority coming from New Zealand. And cheese imports, especially speciality cheeses, remain the biggest dairy import. And over the past 10 years, imports have grown by more than 30%. In New Zealand, the heavy reliance on exporting requires imports of dairy ingredients to meet demand. And the US, Australia and Germany are the major sources of supply. The leading imports are whey powder, lactose to be used in the manufacture of whole milk powder and cheese. Next slide, please. Free trade agreements, we've already talked about this a little bit, but both the Australian and the New Zealand free trade agreement have been agreed in principle. The Australian one in June and New Zealand uh, last month. So they're now at the stages of negotiating the legal text and processes before they can be signed and then sent for parliamentary scrutiny in both countries before being entered into force as per the agreement. So the benefits of both the FDAs are expected to include the elimination of tariffs, flexible rules of origin, clearer customs procedures and potential protection for geographical indications. There will be transitional periods for some elements, including quota tariffs. As Nicola mentioned, the FTAs are also seen as the door to the CPTPP, the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans Partnership, which is made up of 11 countries, namely Australia, Brunei, Canada, Chile, Japan, Malaysia, Mexico, Peru, New Zealand, Singapore, and Vietnam. And within this agreement, 99.9% of all tariffs are eliminated. So this would be a great um, opportunity 
for UK dairy exporters as well. Over to you, Nicola, thank you. Great, thanks, Jane. Um, so, yeah, if we look sort of at the dairy sector, I think it's still looking reasonably attractive um, as, a, as a category in both markets. Um, and so just for the final session of the presentation, we're gonna look at some of the implications of the findings of the reports um, and what they mean for you as UK dairy exporters. Um, and so we'll look at some of the, from our perspective, what are some of the strengths and weaknesses of both markets and also some of, what are some of the opportunities and challenges for us. So in terms of strengths, um, there's probably quite a lot to commend them in terms of um, markets. Um, UK culture is um, similar and it's uh, very well accepted. Um, there are pretty much no language uh, barriers. Um, and even though they have some serious dairy manufacturing capacity, they do view the UK dairy sector as a source of innovation. Um, and our products have excellent acceptance and uh, an image over there as well. Both markets have got significant expat communities, which are always um, an easy springboard into to any market. Consumer, retailer and food service set to focus on health and wellness, um, quality, food safety and security um, play to the strengths of brand Britain. And on a practical level, um, many Australian distributors also serve the New Zealand market as well. So whilst New Zealand is obviously a much smaller market and you might not want to put all your energies into um, focusing on it specifically on its own, um, you can probably what may well be able to find an Australian distributor um, who can serve the market as well for you. Um, and unlike many other markets, and this is quite an important point, UK regional food and drink is known and it's appreciated. So if you go to a market like the US or China, um, you're lucky if um, consumers associate Scotch whiskey and shortbread uh, with Scotland. Um, and But that, that's about it. Whereas in, in Australia and New Zealand, um, there's an affinity with Welsh products, Northern Irish products, um, English products, Scottish products. Um, so that gives them a big, a big advantage. Um, and um, if we look at some of the, um, the, the weaknesses, um, there are strict quarantine requirements for dairy products um, and some import licenses are required. Um, they are significant producers of a similar variety of dairy products. Um, they do have different labelling laws, um, so you may need to invest in changing your um, changing your labelling and uh, packaging. Obviously, geographic distance and time difference. Um, that uh, you know, it's when you're comparing to other markets, um, it's a lot easier to have a, a phone call later this morning with uh, somebody in Europe than it is to arrange to you know, have a chat with Jane just as she's going to bed. You have to get up, get up pretty early. Um, and also that plays a role when it looks when you look at travel budgets, um, that obviously it's a lot more expensive to travel to that part of the world. And also the, the smaller population in New Zealand, if you've got a, a mass market product, um, that can limit um, revenue growth opportunities simply by the sheer, the sheer fact that the population is smaller. So what are the potential opportunities for dairy, uh, dairy exporters? Um, those free trade agreements that we've been talking about should enable all dairy products to enter Australia and New Zealand tariff free. Um, consumers are experimental and they're looking for new and innovative products. The high disposable incomes allow consumers to spend relatively freely on premium and discretionary food and drink items. And the discount sector has actually um, introduced more dynamism into the mass grocery retail sector. Um, Aldi and Costco both have a presence and they've proved that companies don't need to be market leaders to um, have quite a strong influence on the market and on consumers. And as we said before, online grocery sales are relatively low compared to other markets. So there's obviously plenty of headroom for, for growth there in the future. The strong dining out culture and tourist sectors 
um, which have still got room to grow, provide opportunities um, to supply consumer food service sector with new products. And in, for organic products, um, particularly in Australia, although Australia um, is a large producer of organic raw products, it doesn't have the manufacturing capacity to satisfy demand for processed foodstuffs. And although there's this strong buy Australia made, buy New Zealand made that we, we've referred to before, um, which was amplified during the lockdowns, demand remains robust for imported products. Um, even uh, they must be unique um, and not a duplication of products that are already available in the market. So if you've got a product that's inherently Scottish or Welsh or, or um, from Northern Ireland um, or English, um, those will resonate with Australian and New Zealand consumers. So what are some of, some of the challenges? You know, every market's got uh, challenges. So what are, the, what are some of the challenges for UK dairy exporters? Um, as we've seen, both markets have got thriving um, agri-food sectors. Um, and the fact that they're, they're two of the world's largest exporters of agricultural, agricultural commodities, including dairy, um, also present a threat for us, not just in their domestic markets, but also further afield, which um, you know, bear that in mind um, when you're looking at your competitors in other parts of the world, because they are they are very strong. Um, as Jane said, there's strong competition from the US and Asian markets for imported food and drink products. And also um, specifically for dairy, um, Ireland is one of our major competitors. The, the Buy Australia and Buy New Zealand uh, campaigns that we talked about are significant. Um, they're, they're supported by government investment. And there was a recent study um, on the um, Future Brand Country Index in 2020, which talks about uh, and ranks countries by their attractiveness as a country um, and the role that branding plays in um, promoting countries. And... New Zealand came up 10th, Australia 11th, and the UK 20th. So um, it just goes to show, you know, the brand New Zealand and brand Australia are very uh, strong, both with domestic consumers and in export markets. And most categories have got um, substantial market leaders. Um, Anchor, which is Fonterra's uh, brand, is the number one selling FMCG brand in New Zealand supermarkets, um, with a reportedly 1.8 products sold every second over the last year. Um, and there's also high grocery retail market concentration and quite some saturation. So in Australia, the, um, the four main players account for over 80% of the market. So that's Woolworths, Coles, Aldi and Metcash. And in New Zealand, there are just two players accounting for 80% of the market. So Foodstuffs um, Limited and Progressive Enterprises, who are coincidentally owned by um, Woolworths in Australia. The re-implementation of um, the lockdowns, um, restrictions thanks to the COVID-19 Delta variant um, will continue to drag on spending in the out of home sectors and the rapid rise of discounting and price wars threatens grocery retailer profit margins, which is obviously going to have an impact further back further down the supply chain. Um, and something that I didn't realise until we looked into um, these markets is that New Zealand has got the highest levels of in-store promotions um, for food and drink products in the world. So, so again, something to, uh, to bear in mind. So finally, what are, what are some tips um, for success when you either enter Australia or New Zealand, or if you're already exporting there, want to build your business um, further? Um, offerings to the major chains need to be different. They need to be innovative. They're not looking for additional suppliers of basic products um, because the food retail sector, as we said, is highly competitive and most categories have already got um, significant market leaders. Um, that focus on made and grown in Australia and New Zealand um, means that um, you need to have really strong USPs for your, for your products. Um, and you need to convey those USPs on your packaging and on your, on your labeling. 
Portion and pack sizes um, are also um, increasingly important. Um, portion sizes because um, consumers are seeking quality over quantity. And they, as I said, they also expect their packaging to be informative, environmentally responsible. Um, logistics and distribution, uh, something that you absolutely need to get right, um, not just because of the distance from the UK, but because of those the sheer size and scale um, of the countries themselves. And finally, and this goes for you know, for any market, but um, make sure that you do your utmost to leverage those positive links um, with Britain and the perception of brand Britain by emphasizing the quality of your products, um, their provenance, their heritage, the fact that they're, they're safe, because that will resonate with Australian and New Zealand consumers and retailers. So as you look at your target markets for 2022 and beyond, um, hopefully we've given you a bit of a better idea of whether Australia and New Zealand um, should go onto your shortlist um, and stay on your shortlist and whether they're worth um, some further in investigation. So one of the um, main benefits for um, members of the FDA and one of our strengths um, is the willingness of our members to share their experiences and their knowledge, which is absolutely invaluable. Um, and today is no exception. Um, and so I'm delighted that um, Cheryl Brett, who is the Export Sales Manager at Coombe Castle, um, is joining us today to tell us what's really happening um, in the market, what it's like to supply Australia and New Zealand. Um, so I'm just going to stop sharing. There we go. Hi, Cheryl. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Cheryl Brett, and I'm the International Sales Manager at Coombe Castle. Um, I think you have some questions for me, Nicola, so we'll, we'll go ahead with that. And, uh, I do. <laughs> yeah, I was going to, going to ask you, first of all, um, just tell us a little bit about Coombe Castle's Australian and New Zealand uh, export journey. Well, it actually started before my time. I've been in Coombe Castle uh, for just over two years, and my predecessor actually started the journey in around 2016. In fact, it was slightly before then, probably two years previous, because um, we met um, distributors in, in, at trade shows and um, trade missions and that kind of thing. Um, it actually took around 18 months to two years to actually establish any business at all. Um, so basically, um, my predecessor set up the accounts and everything and established the, 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 the distributors in those two markets. And since then, and since my starting here, I've taken them on board, and uh, we've seen good growth. So, and what sort of products um, go down well with Australian and New Zealand consumers? Well, you've actually touched on a lot of that, uh, Nicola, because you know, in terms of brand Britain, in terms of provenance, uh, organic is certainly a big trend. Uh, they have a high GDP, um, so it means that they can afford. Um, the provenance and, and the quality goods that we can offer at Coombe Castle. So I, I guess um, you've really you've really already touched on on, on, on the fact that it's provenance, brand Britain, quality, and um, anything a little bit unique really. And um, the USP has to be strong in those markets, and they feel that point of difference is really a, a selling point for them. Yeah, it's always good to hear that uh, what we think is is happening is really happening. So it's always good to have that confirmed, even if we are ag agreeing. Um, yeah, it's and years. I mean, cheddar with champagne, or or, or, or that, that's just one example, or Devonshire cream, uh, clotted cream, that that kind of that kind of thing is really what they're searching for. Sounds good. I like the sound of that. <laughs> um, and have you had to adapt any of your products and, and packaging um, to respond to any sort of particular trends or preferences? I mean, obviously, some markets you really have to do quite a lot of product and packaging adaptation. Do you, have you found that to be the case in Australia and New Zealand? Yes, it certainly has. There's certainly um, different different uh, regulations involved for those two markets. So in terms of the um, packaging, the nutritional tables, and um, it has to have an imported by um, name on it, so our name is on there. So yeah, there's, there's actually quite a lot of work in the background to ensure that 
everything on the health certificate and the, the regulations matches what we're actually sending out to those countries. So there, there, there is um, a significant amount of back work that is required uh, for that, um, and our technical technical teams are very busy, um, basically amending and, and adjusting the packaging accordingly. And, and you know, in terms of the, the, the appetite for new products, because there is such an appetite, there's always a churn of new products coming through. So. Um, it can be pretty pretty hectic at times, especially with the run-up to Christmas. All of those containers have gone now, so we're, we're, we're in a good position. But, um, you know, we had a very busy couple of weeks in, in September, October, where there was lots of, um, you know, new products being listed and, and going out into containers. So, yeah, that there is definitely a, a, a big amount of work to do on that front. Yeah, and you said you were on the phone early this morning to your to your distributor. Um, presumably, having a good um, partner locally, partner like for other markets, is is key. And they you sort of work together on adapting products and packaging. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, the transfer of information and the transparency is key. Um, certainly, we 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 have a you know it it, it it's a relatively small market, um, so. You know, in terms of that, one of the first questions that comes up is about exclusivity and, and can they offer that. So we do, we do kind of work with with, with one or two partners and have very different um, products that we offer to those different partners. So that that may be something that comes up for many new people embarking on 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 a, on a journey in export in those countries. Yeah, and I know obviously you haven't uh, managed to get out to the markets for a while, but um, are there any kind of um, how do they compare to other markets in terms of uh, terms of doing business? Are there any major challenges? Um, again, you, you have outlined some of those challenges. I mean, obviously, there's a strong local market. You've got Front Frontera as, as well, which are one of the biggest exporters of dairy products in the world. Um, you know, it's a longer shipping time. It's um, the language is easy. Culturally, we're similar, so this all makes things quite 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 straightforward. Um, it's you know, doing business in lockdown has been, it's been good because we've seen really good growth. Uh, obviously with everybody at home and, and the retail and, and has been very strong in, in the, because of that. Um, but we we would normally see these customers and we would normally be out to trade shows, be all, not normally out visiting them in Australia and New Zealand, but obviously we just haven't been able to do that at the moment. But how, you know, I was on a call this morning on, on, on Teams, so it, it, it can work and it has worked because we've seen growth in, 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 in both of the markets. Um, I guess in terms of how does it compare, com competition is strong. As we say, price is also key, you know, that you're right about the, 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 the promotions and the discounts, they're, they're really quite, um, there's a lot going on in those markets, so we have to be very competitive on, on the pricing front. Um, and also, I, I guess that, you know, there's a longer, as I said, the longer shipping time can mean that things are on the water for longer. They might want to stretch payment terms as a result of that because obviously they can't pay for the goods before they arrive. So that's an, a, another point that may be quite important for people to know. Um, but I guess that, that is pr it's pretty, pretty easy, pretty straightforward actually compared to some of the other markets that I have to deal with. Great, and obviously you don't want to give away any of your trade secrets, but uh, any uh, any sort of basic tips for um, fellow exporters, perhaps com companies who are new to looking at um, Australia and New Zealand for the first time? Um, I think, you know, leveraging those um, brand Britain and, and, and the provenance attached to the British products is, is certainly um, a, a tip, you know, really use that to your advantage. Um, you know, seasonal as well. I mean, we, we see that a lot of the retailers are really have this seasonal calendar that, we, you know, certainly in the UK, something for Valentine's, something for St. Patrick's Day, there's something for Easter. And so it's really trying to, 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 to leverage that as well to see if there's anything that you can boost sales in, in, in those times. Um, you know, you mentioned about the shipping and the ro robust routes to market in terms of logistics. I think that's certainly uh, key. You need to have your ducks in a row when it comes to understanding, um, you know, move, moving the goods and, and having a, a good network uh, once it gets there. Um, and, you know, if, if I, I guess another another point is if there's not scale there, then that could also be tricky because getting products into Europe before getting into Australia is, is also a challenge at, at the moment. So that's a, 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 another point. So 
yeah, so that that's kind of going to be tricky if, 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 the, if the scale isn't there at, at the first point. Um, and be patient, you know. And I mentioned initially that um, it took around two years for my colleagues to, 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 to even start doing any business. Um, I think the main concern around that was exclusivity. Um, that the distributor that we were working with in Australia actually didn't think that we could offer exclusivity, but actually we managed that through offering a, a, them a unique range of products just for them, and um, it, it didn't affect any of the other work that we were doing. So um, find the right distributor is another one, um, and define that as well, you know, with um, with a timeline and also a volume attached to it, because uh, really that's your if they don't deliver for you, that's your get out of free jail card essentially. So I think that's that's key. And and, and have regular catch ups and, and chit chats with them and talks and hopefully we, we will be welcome back sometime soon. So <laughs> I'm sure you will be. Hopefully you'll be able to get out get back out there soon. And uh, thank you very much. That was really insightful and uh, and always thank thank you for your generosity in uh, sharing your experiences and you know as I said it's always good to to hear it straight from the horse's mouth of somebody who's out there doing the doing um, what it what it's really like on the ground so thank you very much um, so I'm going to hand back to you Lucy um, I may hi there um, yeah thank you very much for that that was um, actually pretty comprehensive uh, I think you guys did really well there um, we do have a couple of questions um, I've got one specifically I think it's just um, around sort of the COVID spending and actually I've written this down but you mentioned about the fact that they're now got the buy Oz and buy New Zealand campaigns um, and I think that uh, is that is that going to affect things going forward because obviously we've seen the success in the US of the victory cheese um, sort of little campaign that they've got going on um, and obviously they're now trying to sort of replicate that in Australia you know will that affect us do you think or do you think that they're a pretty experienced, sort of robust consumer spending um, sort of sector. You know, will that be an issue? Jane, do you want to answer that one? As you're in the yes. midst of it all. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, it's certainly a, a very strong campaign, and particularly with the pandemic and, as we've said, supply chain issues and the long lockdowns. You know, people have been shopping local and supporting local brands. But that said, the Australian consumer is still looking for things that are new and super premium as well. So they'll recognise the UK as market leaders in certain categories and, and dairy certainly fall, falls into that. So it just makes things a lot more competitive and it's hard. But as we keep saying, if you've got that USP, if there's a gap in the market that you can fill and really sell, of compelling position to a potential partner, then you know there are opportunities there. Great, thank you. Um, I've actually got a question from Tim Harris from Lycross about organic products. Um, organic products lack capacity, true, but pricing is very competitive with New Zealand supply. Um, we have a carbon footprint to Australia um, for supply of organic dairy does raise concerns. What are your thoughts? Have you got any thoughts on that, Jane? Um, nothing that, that really jumps out other than, you know, it is true, organic is, is very strong. People will pay a premium for it, whether that be local or imported. Um, and again, people are looking for products that are more environmentally friendly, more sustainable. So that's certainly something to bear in mind when you, you're approaching somebody in market. Yeah, and I think, um, yeah, unfortunately for us, not only is New Zealand near, but I think they have, I think I'm right in saying they've got the lowest carbon um, footprint in the world when it comes to, to dairy products. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we can't get away from it. Uh, we can't ch change where we're, where we're located. But, um, yeah, I think just finding the most environmentally friendly way of getting your products to that part of the world or any part of the world um, and and also demonstrating how you're doing that I think that's you know it just makes good good sense to 
um, to look at your entire supply chain, um, say wherever you're exporting to, and make sure that it is environment as environmentally friendly as, as possible. Um, how much is it a concern, do you think, to the Australian consumer? I mean, how much, you know, is that side of it brought up in Australia about <clears throat> reducing your carbon footprint, you know, trying to be more sustainable, that kind of side of it? Is that something that um, UK consumers need to make sure that they integrate into their story um, when they're exporting over there? Do you think this is something that they should be looking at? I do think it's something that um, UK exports exporters should be looking at but but that said um australia i i would say is a bit more behind the uk from that aspect so there could be a bit of, of leverage there as we've said new zealand is probably a bit a bit further on plus the fact that they're actually quite a distance from quite a lot of things aren't they so they have to look at the importing side of it i suppose yeah. Yeah, I think it's about like everywhere. It's balancing that, you know, sort of the business case with the environmental, uh, the environmental case, and that's going to be, um, you know, the case for wherever we export products to, um, and that sort of whole sustainability, environmentally responsible story is going to have to come much more into how we um, promote our products and our and our brands. I think just in general. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so just to tell everybody, if you'd like to ask a question, please do pop it in the question box and I will do my best um, to get to it. Um, got another question here. Um, hi, I'm Trevor Smith, UK based consultant to Dairy Australia. For Australia companies wishing to export to the UK and the FTA, can you see hooking up with UK exporters to Australia as facilitating access to the UK market? Sorry, Lucy, I missed the second half of the, yeah, I um, did. <laughs> oh, sorry. the question. I'll read it again. Um, have, I'm Trevor Smith, UK-based consultant to Dairy Australia. For Australian companies wishing to export to the UK under the FTA, can you see hooking up with UK exporters to Australia as facilitating access to the UK market? I'm not sure I quite understand the, the question. Sorry, Trevor. <laughs> is that reciprocal trade? Is that what, what the question yeah, I think, I think that's trade rather out. than working together? Yeah. Yeah, so, so working together can help facilitate trade both ways for them. I, I think in principle, yes. Um, whether you can get companies to do that in reality, I think sort of on a company to company basis, that's going to be very, very tricky. Um, is going to need a, a bigger engine um, to to bring that about. I would have I would have thought. I mean, I think I think he was talking about because he's just popped here um, to do with things like transport. So you know, container coming going out, full container coming back, that kind of thing. Yeah. So sort of uh, collaborating to make to get efficiencies and economies of of scales both both ways. Um, yeah. yeah. That that certainly makes you know perfect sense. Um, Sarah, yeah, is that is something it... you guys would be interested in? Sorry, I was on mute. Yes, definitely. I mean, I, I think the point goes back to the scalability as well. Um, you know, if, if there isn't any scale, then in, at first, you would certainly be happy to have a chat with anyone who's interested in moving goods into Australia or New Zealand. Uh, and. We, we can help with that definitely yeah no, i think it's, sorry sorry i was just gonna say i think it's a really good point we, we work with um you know logistics companies who operate in that part of the world who are based in australia um and um it's probably a, a round table in itself i should think it's a, a next topic of discussion um and certainly we can you know start start having the conversations with them um about working together on the logistics side. Right. Okay. Um, quick question for me. Um, if you know, has Cheryl has um, has sort of COVID affected the way that you do business over there? I mean, you've mentioned the sort of team side of it, but of course, new business. Now, have you been relying on your partner to, to, to try and sort of get new business over there? Um, has it slowed things down, you not being able to, to, to be in front of them? Or, you know, because it's Australia and you, you struggle with distance anyway, has it just been a continuation of, of the status quo? I, I, guess, I guess from um, an 
Australian point of view, um, they, there's still really an appetite for new products and new listings hasn't really halted. However, what we've seen in New Zealand is actually they, they, they've stayed with the same range largely and the kind of new listing stroke brand extensions have been somewhat limited. So um, I'm hoping that's going to change um, in, in the future. Um, but I, that's my, my ongoing observation really, um, that they're, they're slightly differing in, 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 in how they, they, they work through the pandemic. Right. I was just into a sort of practical level. Um, I was on a, um, a round table a couple of weeks ago with some ASEAN distributors, uh, not specifically Australia and New Zealand, but they were saying about how during the pandemic, the sort of the way of communicating and the frequency of communicating um, has changed for the better that even through the pandemic they wanted to be able to focus on um, on your brands and you know doing their doing their thing in market and these sort of the days of having a quarterly or annual review um, are th there's a shift towards um, more frequent but sort of more lighter touch communication so they'd rather um, be hit sort of have a, a half an hour session in the diary once a month than these sort of a big quarterly review and they felt that it's actually helped to keep um, motivation, it's helped to keep dynamism, it's, it means that you know people are keeping much more up to date and it's actually facilitated much better communication. Um, so um, which I thought was you know, an, interesting, an interesting and positive shift. I would agree actually, we, we speak to our distributors probably more uh, since the pandemic um, because we were relying trade shows and those kind of coming together at Gulf Foods or Anuga or Seattle, uh, whereas, you know, you know, it would literally be once every two, three weeks, I would sit down and have a, a Teams meeting with, with, with both of them. So, yeah, it, or, or WhatsApp, WhatsApp seems to be the kind of mode of communication between myself and customers. So, um, but, but it works, you know, there's a call on WhatsApp or there's a video call or there's just messaging and then, yeah, it, it's definitely, I think it's actually better than what it was. All right. Um, if anybody has any other questions, um, pop them in the box now. Um, but otherwise, I think I think you guys have been pretty comprehensive. Do you have anything else to add at all? Um, no, I was actually just going to ask Cheryl a question about um, you mentioned about seasonality. Um, do you think there are opportunities for uh, UK exporters to take advantage of the fact that obviously the different seasonality in, in um, Australasia. Um, are there opportunities, any specific opportunities that um, where you can, you know, perhaps balance your um, balance your portfolio and you can send bigger volumes of product at certain times of the year that you wouldn't necessarily think about sitting in the UK? Do you mean um, calendar dates that are not typical? Yeah, any specific sort of big, um, big I volume, big consumption moments in Austra Australasia that that um, differ from from here. Yeah, I mean we what are kind of on board with that. I mean, um, the Queen's birthday is a big thing um, in, in Australia, so you know we kind of have items that we're we're, we're moving towards for, for that occasion as well. So. Yeah, I mean, I think the answer to the question is yes. Um, I'm sure there's days in Australia that I'm completely on un news that I'm completely unaware of that perhaps we can we can fit fit, fit a, a particular product in there. So yeah, absolutely. Did you send anything out for to, to um, today for the bank holiday <laughs> for the Melbourne no. is Melbourne Cup, oh, Jake? Melbourne <laughs> today. <laughs> I think it's probably champagne rather than dairy products being consumed. Yeah. Right. Next time. Right. Well, I think if there are no more questions, um, we can probably round it up there. Um, just want to say um, thank you very much to Nicola, Jane, and Cheryl for presenting and expanding on the report. Um, I think you'll agree it's been extremely informative. Um, I hope we managed to answer any questions you had. Um, as I said at the beginning, this report will now be circulated to you post event and will hopefully prove useful. Um, and please do take the time to, to complete the event evaluation. Um, so it only leaves for me to say thank you for joining us and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks, Lucy.